uh, David Walters from Cincinnati, is it? Right. Right. And David has been a long time uh, student and researcher on the subject of Vulcan. He's written a, uh, a rather large book on the subject and uh, probably knows more about Vulcan than anyone I know. So interestingly enough, his subject is on Vulcan. <laughs> Maybe with a little Saturn thrown in. These we welcome David. Thank you, David. Okay. Take it away. Sorry, first of all, I just wanted to. <laughs> Two years ago, I started, I, I've been blessed that Cincinnati has a large collection. Uh, the public library has a large collection of Alan Leo's modern astrology. Seven, test, 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 is it, is it? Okay, okay. And what I've done is put them on a DVD and they'll be available at the bookstore. Alan Leo uh, was, more than anything else, the first person who got out of the Dubin He, okay, there we go. And what he did was also serialized all of his books in it. And he, the first editions, which were in modern astrology, really were more esoteric than the final published versions. So they're all on here. Now, this is funny. I remember talking with Tanya the first day that we, I got here at breakfast, and every time I tried to say Alan Leo, it came out Alan Oaken. And, and I couldn't figure out why until, oh my gosh, what if Alan Oaken was the next incarnation of Alan Leo? And it fits. Both were very, you know, fire signs um, and everything else. And I emailed Alan after the conference last year, and he says he got an immediate response. I might well have been. <laughs> it was his response. Ah. <laughs> anyway, the interesting thing is, Michael, is that the Sutcliffe character who we figured out uh, in 98 or so that I was also knew Alan Leo very well, and as I just told Philip a little while ago, uh, he was one of the people who set up one of the initiations for one of the times for Krishnamurti. I, there was an article in the Theosophist about it. So it gets interesting. So these will be available at, in the bookstore tomorrow at a very reasonable cost. Um, and as I try to get more of them, um, I will make sure that next year that they're made available. Okay, Vulcan, 1986. I attended Alan Oaken's lecture on, on esoteric astrology at a UAC conference. And that was the first time I ever heard about Vulcan. And 
And so when I got back home, I found, that, found the Western book somewhere and read it. And gee, my scientific fifth ray mindset, there's got to be more than this. But I couldn't find anything. Then I happened to read a book about the discovery of Pluto called Planet X and Pluto. And in there was one chapter on Vulcan. Um, and that I'll get into what he said. But the nice thing was is that it had references in the scientific literature. Oh, my. And fortunately, between the public library in Cincinnati and the University of Cincinnati Libraries, they had 80, 90 percent of what I wanted. And as I was just telling somebody else, yeah, there'll be a third edition, hopefully next year. And the stuff I couldn't get was mostly in Europe. And now it's more available due to, and I will start trying to get after it. Alrighty. Where do we begin? Um, yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. All righty. Take a look at this statement. Antoine Leverrier in 1843 wrote this about the theory of Mercury's orbit. <laughs> right for? You better believe it. That was in the Comprendus of the Academy des Sciences of France, France, which was the major publication of the era. <laughs> yeah. So, in 1849, he had gone back in the meantime, he had discovered Neptune. And so he finally figured out there were 38 seconds of the perihelion movement per century to represent all the transits to a precise second. And the only way that that was feasible was for a planet to be inside the orbit of Mercury. So, okay, let's go to the Bailey material. Treatise on Cosmic Fire. What? at the last statement there. Okay. Okay, this one. You will note that the first ray influence expressing through Pluto and Vulcan is, is only felt in a positive man, man, manner upon the path of discipleship. This first ray potency has only lately been experienced by humanity as a whole that is near the stage of being the world disciple. And vast numbers relatively stood upon the path of discipleship. Hence the recent discovery of Pluto and the sense power of Vulcan, veiled by the potency of Mercury and hidden behind that planet sense power. 
page 199, I don't have that one in this to show. He says, uh, the first indication of true spiritual will will only begins to manifest upon the path of discipleship. Hence, the late discovery of these two planets. Late in the point of time and from the angle of human knowledge, for it is only in this Aryan race that humanity is to any large extent beginning to manifest evidence, and yet, and yet it is no more of a reaction or a response to the spiritual will of the of deity. The late discovery of these two planets. EA was published, that's on page 195, 96. EA was published in 1951, but it was written or transmitted about 1934. So that gives us a starting point. All righty. This is just a, a statement about the power of Vulcan. This is a situation which would confront the know knowers of the race and their various grades of knowledge and illumination at this time. Neither of these influences, either the Turin or the Aquarian, can be avoided. As you will see when we study the analysis of its rulers, Tar Taurus forges the instruments of constructive living of destruction. It forges the change which bind or create the key which unlocks the mystery of life. It is in this foregoing process, forging process, with its consequent clamor, which is going on at this time in the most potent manner. Vulcan controls the anvil-like processes of time and strikes the blow which shapes the metal into what which is desire, and this is true today as never before. Okay. Um, let me, at this point, just don't worry about that. Um, Leverrier, when he came up with his conclusions, went back through all the so-called observations of unknown bodies near the sun, and there really weren't any that really fit any test that wor worked out. Um, then in 1859, a French country doctor by the name of Les Carbeau observed a body transit the sun, and let me get to the chart of that right there. Uh, is there any way we can move it over? Okay. All righty, good. Okay, this one actually kind of looks like it's feasible. Um, and Laveri what Leverrier did was, once he heard about it, is went down to Orgères, which is near Paris, and questioned the guy unmercifully and concluded that it was an observation. And it seems to be true, but, and I made this observation to somebody yesterday, that what needs to be done with the observational data is it needs to be redone. That it needs to be done using the measures of today because simply they, people were com the computers and they used logarithms for multiplication, and those tables had errors in them. So it would be nice, and I'm going to check with the Paris Observatory 
hey, can it be redone? Can we see what? It basically went over the north uh, east edge of the sun. The next, and then there were a few more observations in the 1980s, uh, or 18, six, fifth, sixties, and then came the eclipse of 1878 out west in the United States. And all sorts of astronomers were there wedding, ready. The two people, a guy named Watson, the other by the name of Lois, of two separate parties, each quote, quote, found, two of them found two bodies. They didn't match. Um, and right over there on the right out of view is Neptune, squaring everything up in the ninth house. And come on, it, it, you know, really a, a full-time illusion. So after that, the search kind of died down. And then what happened was uh, Mr. Einstein's theory of relativity. The amount of the s number of seconds of arc uh, had been reduced to 24. And guess what? Einstein's theory explained it. No more need for Vulcan to... Now, that's assuming that the speed of light is what it was. If you hit, remember sometime earlier this year, the speed of light was a little more than they thought it was. So what does that have in terms of implications? I don't know. Um, OK. So let's go back. Uh, in 1987, some scientists came up with the idea, and they explored it. Very, this is just the very end type of statement about the possibility, rather than one solid body, that they be, there is a very plausible population of potential Mercury-specific impactors. Asteroid-like bodies, vulcanoids, in orbits near the, to such to the, to the Earth, to Mercury. Such vulcanoids would have to be Mercury-specific, since few of them can be scattered by Mercury beyond its zone to crater the Moon or other inner planets. 1987. Then, as I was looking through my quotes by the Tibetan, I found this. Unseen planets. Not all of the intramercurial planets, nor those yet those in the orbit of Neptune, are yet discovered, although we, they are strongly suspected. We know that such exist, and where they exist, and that they, they are there in innumerable planets, quote, burnt out, they say. In obscuration, we say, planets in formation and not yet luminous, etc. My goodness, 1925. So, um, there have been searches for the Vulcanoids up to about four or five years ago. None have been found. So, the only real observation would be that of Les Carbos. That's the only one that's really, the, the problem with the other ones was that they weren't done scientifically. Oh, it went across, but no times. Les Carbo took the care to 
time, make notes of times and places on the sun that it was when it, he didn't see when it entered, but shortly thereafter, but he marked the exit time. That is perfectly a beautiful scientific observation. So we go over those. Okay, solar fire has two versions of Vulcan. Baker's orbit, which says that Mercury, uh, Vulcan is always within three degrees of Mercury. There was an article written in the 1950s or 1960s by an astronomer who proved that Mercury does not have the capacity to hold a satellite. It cannot retain one. And in 1993, in his dictionary, dictionary of astrology, Baker moved to the Vulcanoid theory. Um, I think that was, he had been getting too much complaints about it. Okay, the other one is that of L.H. Weston, and then after him, Carl Stahl. Stahl, um, Weston's orbit were based on 12 observations that are mostly suspect. Uh, the only one that I even really found was that of Les Carbos. Uh, like, for example, there was one of a Captain Bester in 1908 off a steamer outside of off the west coast from Portland. But it didn't even really have a date. So um, again, when you're talking about a planet that's going to go around the sun in 20, 18 to 20 days, you better be as accurate as you can. Um, back in the late 80s, I had gotten into this enough that I was suspicious of it. And so Neil Mickelson generously generated an ephemeris for Weston's, using Weston's orbit. And I found out of the 12 observations that only four of them, including Les Carbos, in that, that Vulcan was retrograde at the time. In or, and in order for a planet to transit the sun, it must be retrograde. So, uh, because it's going across through inferior conjunction, and that's always retrograde. Okay, the other thing is there are six orbital elements for any planet. And three of them are the astronomical unit distance, which tells how far it's from the sun, the eccentricity of the orbit, and the maximum elongation. Now, there are simple algebraic formulas to convert any two to the third. So if I took the astronomical distance and the eccentricity, you get the maximum elongation. Guess what? It wasn't that of what he gave me. And if I took the eccentricity and the maximum elongation, I didn't get the astronomical unit. So, neither one's valid. Um, and there is a note in Solar Fire, pretty well buried, but it's there because I, when Graham was there, Dawson was there, I communicated everything saying use them with care because he understood the mathematics but it's kind of hard 
for the average public to do so. I learned about a lot about orb orbital how orbits work. Okay, so how do we determine our placement of Vulcan? There are two th key things here. One is the moon veils Vulcan. So I came up with the theory that what we can do is because Vulcan can never be more than 8 degrees 20 seconds away from the sun. And that, by the way, not by accident, is the width of the ecliptic on one side. Um, so it's always within the ecliptic. And basically, by ha hacking away 15 degree intervals, you'll wind up within eight degrees. That's one way. And the second way, Michael, I believe many years ago, we did it with you. All right, Vulcan is ray one. When Pluto comes in hard aspect with your sun, it's also going to be in hard aspect with Vulcan. Now, about half the time, Vulcan is within two degrees of your sun. So, if it's there, your Pluto sun square, for example, is going to be really, have a lot of first ray energy in it. If it's beyond two degrees, away, it'll happen separately. And that's what I think we figured out with you. Um, we're talking a little long time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but that, that's something you as astrologers should look at. When, when you get, get a sense that, that if you know the person is having a uh, Pluto's approaching, like for example, it's approaching my son now, um, and isn't quite there. But yet, I knew I was able to figure out where my Vulcan was. It's at ten Capricorn, and it got up to nine before retrograding. So I've been using that power for transformation rather than destruction. <laughs> and that's the key. Because on the personality level, person, Pluto transits are all about destruction. On the soul level, it's about transformation. So you have to, and so ask questions. Are there things going on in the person's life that are just pure first ray? One interesting comment I'll make right now. Officially, Pluto is not a planet anymore. So officially, astronomy the first ray doesn't, quote, exist anymore because Vulcan has never been rediscovered. And that's it. Okay. That's it on that. So, um, I found that to be curious. Um, but yet, the energy is there. It's just more latent, unfortunately. Um, okay. I'm not going to do charts here. I will be happy to do them throughout the conference. So if you bring up your chart, I'll try to help you find your Vulcan. Now, questions.
Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that works in your case. Uh, actually, I don't think it did. Oh. Okay. It was just uh, back around that time. I may have had a square or a semi-square. Uh, more likely a semi-square. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and, and what is this idea that? Um, Vulcan is usually within two degrees of the sun. Why, why is that? Because um, it spends mo okay, Mercury, okay, this is true for Mercury and Venus. Well, all right, Venus is now like, I, I saw 42 degrees out away, yes. almost at its elongation. It isn't there very much. Right. Uh, either both in the morning sky and in the evening. Mm -hmm. It's mostly around the sun because it has to pass behind it or in front of it. And when it, and w it, the, when it passes in front, again, it's retrograde. The one in coming up in June happens to be a transit because it's close to the nodes of Venus. It works exactly like a solar or a lunar eclipse okay. uh, that way. So um, it's not like the moon because, but it, it's just the way the inner orbits work. Mm -hmm. uh, so they spend most of their time nearer the sun than they do far out. So one more question here. Uh, you said that um, Pluto-Sun aspects are mostly destructive on the personality level. Right. And so you discriminate between the meaning of a Pluto-Vulcan aspect, which you say are transformational. They can be. Can be, but, not, but also uh, destructive. Uh, sure. No? Yes. Yeah, it depends on where the person you're doing the chart for mm -hmm. is. It's not that it's automatically transformational it's um, yeah exactly so do we think then that it's most easy to detect Vulcan positions in a chart if the people have their Vulcan relatively far from the chart from the Sun yeah then closer yeah because you're not getting the energy and particularly if the Sun <laughs> doesn't have any well, if the sun has tight aspects with the other planets, then then um, the the Vulcan Pluto Vulcan will show up because it isn't involved with the sun. Right, right, exactly. So, are you undertaking some research here with people's charts? You know, in other words, you're you're giving them their Vulcan position somewhat, okay? Yeah. But the question is, uh, can we confirm this in any way? Sure. Okay. If any of you are, uh, you know, in this uh, group this size, there are the odds are somebody is having a Pluto hard aspect sun. <coughs> Those would be the people to, that I would like to talk with more because we can work on it mm -hmm. um, uh, rather than, okay, now, and um, because that way we can work on making it rather than a destructive, um, and we can check on yeah. where. So right now, obviously, we're talking about uh, 12 or about eight to 10 of the cardinal signs and 25, 27, 26, 28 of the mutables, Scorpio, because those are the semi-squares. Does anybody here have their sun within the early uh, 8 to 10 of the cardinal signs or late mutables? I do. I'm willing to volunteer. 
It seems about time. <laughs> 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 no, no, not, not. But you know, look, it, maybe this is a chance not just for David to give you his impression of where the position is, but to work with you a little bit to look for those destructive moments in your life which might help zero in on the actual right. position. You but might want to hunt him up, you know. He's probably less elusive than Vulcan. <laughs> and uh, work a little bit on this. It would seem uh, a good opportunity. I intend to hunt you up, David. Okay. Okay, I've got a square of sun to, uh, of Pluto to the sun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right mm -hmm. And if I recall, the last time was when it was semi-square. Oh, okay. Well, I forgot <laughs> I've repressed that crisis. <laughs> 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 because we did this about in the mid-90s. Mid-90s. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been about right. Okay. Well, good. Sure. Yeah. Check one, two. In 1990, I went to an astrology conference in San Francisco, and one of the lectures I attended was on suicides. Um, the lecture itself wasn't very interesting, but at the end there were questions uh, or comments, and the woman sitting behind me was a nurse at uh, San Francisco General Hospital who was an astrologer, and she said that she had been making a note of all the suicides brought in, uh, just with their birth date, and looked at the aspects, and she said 80% of them had a Pluto squaring their sun. Okay, and and if that's the case, there's a good chance it was squaring their bulk. Remember that Pluto's the destructive aspect of the first ray. Vulcan is the creative. And sometimes, all right, by transformation, that means you've got to let go of some of the crappy stuff you're doing in your life so that you can allow the creative stuff to start flowing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, similar to that, uh, Bonnie, um, in, in Denmark, um, we have a friend who has a cancer hospital, and he uh, is an astrologer. So, so many people that are checking in uh, with uh, emerging cancer, uh, Pluto square the sun. See, or Pluto aspects, very, very strong. Other, other things as well. So that's getting it out of your system, so to speak. Yeah, and I'll mention this as an, a point of interest. Um, a couple years ago, I noticed some 21-year-old people, especially women, started becoming really interested in me. I was wondering why. And then I finally, you know, because I'm 65, <laughs> hey, hey, you know. Don't you have Scorpio or something? Yeah, <laughs> a few things. Uh, anyway, no. So anyway, I finally did the chart of one, and it was, oh my God, they have Saturn Neptune conjunct my son Mars, and their Uranus conjunct my Mercury. Um, yeah, okay. that, that, that's enough. Uh, now, in particular, there's one that I won't go into. No, don't go into it. No, no. <laughs> but, but, no. And so my question is, what's going to happen with this group of people conceived and born between 88 and 90 who, when Saturn, when Pluto starts walking over their Sun, or their Saturn, Neptune. It walked over their Uranus this year mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and last year. So, um, because um, this is something I, I got into, which I won't get into any further here, but um, these people, you know, there are times at which the outer planets form aspects that permit, I, I believe, more soul-oriented people to incarnate. And 1988 to 90 was a particularly important. And the fact that, you know, up, uh, up to a dozen women have shown some interest in me 
like, uh, yeah, yeah. I go like, huh? You, you know, I'm not doing anything. They're Look, I'll tell you what. Go see David. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but the point is, is that they seem to sense something out of me, and um, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, we ought to be, as astrologers, be looking for other time periods. Mm. Because that way, we as astrologers can re realize this when they're young. Right. <laughs> okay. okay, David, Th we thank you for your latest on Vulcan, okay? Okay. Just uh, go, go see David and he'll um, find something in your chart you don't expect.